Um, so I'd like to introduce, I'm very proud to, for, to uh, introduce this morning uh, the award, Storch Award winner. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the 2002 Storch Award uh, Symposium. Uh, the winner this year is Dr. Bertram Davis, who is Associate Director for the Center of Applied Energy Research, University of Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. Now, the Storch Award was established in 1964 by the Fuel Chemistry Division to really recognize distinguished contributions to fundamental or engineering research on chemistry and utilization of hydrocarbon fuels. Now, the award was sponsored by uh, the Fuel Chemistry Division until 85, then Exxon Engineering and Research sponsored it from 87 to 96, and now the Fuel Division again sponsors it from 1997, and this award is given every two years. Now, I pulled up off our you know, division webpage a list of the, the previous winners. Ooh. Of the Storch Award. Now, we almost have too many winners here. To show you that, uh, bird on the bottom, <laughs> but uh, this is a previous list, so uh, there's a, a long list of distinguished fuel scientists that have won this award, and uh, Bert joins a, a long tradition. Now, today, Dr. Davis is being recognized for his uh, creative work in gaining mechanistic insight into complex real-world problems, especially the use of uh, isotope tracer work in doing his mechanistic studies, and one of the reasons for giving Dr. Davis the award is really the breadth of his research and the impact it's had on the fuel chemistry division. He's made significant scientific contributions to direct and indirect coal liquefaction, upgrading coal liquids, mechanisms of alkane dehydrocyclizations, and structures of reforming catalysts. So this is an impressive list of work he's done. And this is just the last five years, not counting <laughs> the other many, many years of his work. So we'd like to go ahead and start the symposium this morning. And we'll say a little bit more about Dr. Davis as the morning proceeds. And uh, I think it's appropriate, you know, our first speaker this morning is Dr. Winder, who will uh, speak on the catalytic dehydrogenation of phenolics and polycyclic olefins in the presence of hydroaromatic compounds. He's from the Chemical and Petroleum Engineering Department, University of Pittsburgh.
wrote several books. And uh, when he left, he finally went to Washington. Uh, directly went to Washington, and then became director of basic research at American Cyanotech. The fellow who took his place, Dick Corey, also went to Washington. I took Dick Corey's place. I went to Washington. And the fellow who took my place went to Washington. But they told me that when you go to Washington, you need a thick skin to survive. And I found when I went there, I got to Washington, my skin was indeed getting thicker. After about a year, it was so thick I could stand up with any back, with no backbone at all. <laughs> So 
we worried about that and uh, decided that we would look into uh, what happens uh, to the phenolics. And before we do that, I got worried about a little bit about the solvent that they use. They use something called phenanthropy, which is 3 4 benzophenone. And of course, there are three isomers of that. And you got to wonder why this was so good. Uh, makes a difference, and I think the next slide will show you why. Uh, at least this, this will, too. Uh, the, the amount of hydrogen that you get off from whatever you're trying to get off from any solid uh, seems to depend on the temperature. I mean, thermodynamically, the higher the temperature, dehydrogenation uh, thermodynamically seeds in at high temperatures. And then we, we measured the halfway potential of these different solvents and found that the more negative they were, it's hard to say what they mean by that more negative, uh, the better solvents uh, they turned out to be. So it turned out to be that you needed a good catalyst. Palladium was by far the best catalyst. Everybody had well in the literature. And you needed a fairly high temperature, but not too high. And you needed fairly not so negative uh, half-wave potential. Uh, you see that phenanthidine, which, which was finally used, gave about a third of the hydrogen from this coal off uh, on dehydrogenation. You collected this as hydrogen gas. Temperature, as you see, and the potential was, half-wave potential was minus 1.53. Its isomer boiled a little bit higher uh, but uh, the amount of hydrogen is less. But you see this is minus 1.60, and it's just to be minus 1.63, and it's not as good. Uh, pyrene uh, boils at 44 degrees higher, and you should get more hydrogen off, uh, but you don't. But it's about the same. In fact, if going over this, uh, in retrospect, maybe pyrene might have been a better solvent to use, but it is a very high boiling solvent. But you see it's minus 1.56, which is in the wrong direction. But if your if your halfway potential, which is essentially the ability to accept the electron, is what if this as this gets very low, the ability of laser fermentum to accept the electron gets to be very high. And if you use this as a solvent, you simply get hydrogen pouring off forever. And what remains in a pot is just a black solvent. So you have to choose something that is sort of just right. And in the next slide, we have the three isomers. Uh, and you see there's quite a difference. Uh, Phenanthrodine is by far the best one that we use, 3, 4, bits, probably. They all give off hydrogen very rapidly in about an hour, and then some of this, practically nothing comes off after that. And uh, while from the previous slide, the boiling points didn't seem to differ much, and their halfway potentials didn't seem to differ much, it did make a great difference, as you can see. So this turned out to be the solvent. Some naphthones, 
two polynuclear aromatic, hydroaromatic compounds, and coal. So we get back. And just because this is fissure tropes, and fissure tropes doesn't give you any, really any, uh, uh, polynuclear stuff or aromatic stuff, I thought to re remind you what they look like. That's for the entity. These are the two compounds we'll be playing around with, 9,10-dihydrophenanthine and 10-dihydrophenanthine. This is the three ring phenol that we use in addition to the, the naphthose. And we'll be talking about 2-methylquinolone. Two 2-methylquinolone, two or quinolone, is simply phenanthine where you remove this aromatic ring and put a methyl group here. And we find that this thing also is a fairly good solvent and can be used in dehydrogenation reaction. Only trouble is you have to have a hydrogen acceptance. There's a hydrogen transfer that goes on here. And this solvent can be used if you have a hydrogen acceptance present. And of course, when it picks up hydrogen, it gives you five pencil. We'll talk about that in a bit. Now, that it does perhaps go after both. It might. 
because we get simply the aromatic, aliphatic ether, uh, and simply almost entirely. And I think it, it may abstract both hydrogen, but you're not getting an aromatic substance, which is rather important. This is coal. We actually decided that we would uh, try uh, to add this phenanthro to coal itself. We again find that some of this hydro, that some of the ether does form. Uh, this is a, is a phenol of some kind. It's oxidated compound. Uh, this is a vinyl, vinyl uh, hydrogen attached to a double bond. And so we know that phenol is attacking something in coal that normally would be hydroaromatic, and it's interfering or in some way affecting the hydrogen that comes off. Uh, when we, if you take 910-dihydroamphetamine and DHP, you get about the same amount of hydrogen off. Uh, with a little bit of, of phenanthrol off, you get this amount. And you, you know that they're going to interact. But when they interact, you find that you get about 10% less hydrogen off than you would expect. So, so what is the interaction? And that is not a, clear, not a clear answer to that at the moment. We to take a peek at, if you remember what canola was, which is 
strictly a tool that whole kind of work. We found that with phenanthrodine, uh, we could dehydrate cold again very rapidly. If we use quinolidine, but we had to add perhaps uh, hydrogen acceptor present, so we would eventually end up with the same amount of hydrogen cut off. The atoms per 100 carbon atoms means that uh, if I dehydrogenate it's a cyclohexane, every hydrogen would come off, and that's 100 hydrogens per 100 carbon atoms. And so this can be used, but it simply takes a longer time. And when we ran an, another rather interesting experiment, we took, uh, it turns out that uh, dihydrophenanthine, dihydroanthocene, and still be all have exactly the same molecular weight. And so we put in a mole, you might say a mole of each, equal amounts anyway. And if you see what happens, the phenanthrene follows the still beam all the way down. This is dihydrophenanthrene. It, it transfers its hydrogen to still beam essentially all the way. The dihydroanthocene, however, uh, very slowly, and most of its hydrogen, most of it does not stay the phenanthrene. It gets rid of all the still beam. And the anthocene starts to give off hydrogen. And if you read the, read the literature, you'll find that most people find that phenanthrene is a much better uh, hydrogen transfer agent than anthocene, and this shows it very well. I, I said I would be disjointed, and this is, and this is what I get, getting another one. So examining the Gregel again, Gregel pointed out that code contains appreciable amounts of we all know that, given uh, I pointed that out, and that many of these were tricyclic terpenes, uh, called uh, sterols, called sintosterol, or stigmasterol. And they said, quote again, it is possible that compounds of these types play a more important part in colorification than is realized. And It does. 
doesn't replace the thing, but it sort of bewitches the sites that cholesterol normally sits down at. And what this is clinically and gone over about a number of times, and it holds up. And you, you can reduce your cholesterol about 20 to 25 percent by eating this stuff. It costs five times as much as butter. But uh, the, you see that a lot of it is available. Actually, the Finns got it from wood. Uh, but you can get it from soybean if you had to. Anyway, uh, so there, of all these isomers of, of uh, torn vegetables, isomers, only one will do the job. But we all know that enzymes are very, very specific. So that's not a great surprise. Now, we thought it would be interesting to dehydrogenate cholesterol. Uh, it has this one double bond, and it pretty much just dehydrogenates again in the, net, in the same phenomenon. It dehydrogenates pretty well, and it goes along, and pretty soon it knocks the, uh, the OH off very easily, and you get uh, seven moles of hydrogen very nicely and essentially quantitative. However, if you take that good old hexamethylsilazine and add it to that OH group here, you do not dehydrogenate this bond. Everything else goes well, but that CHC, that trimethylsilazine group, just prevents the dehydrogenation of this, uh, of this group. And, uh, so you get one mole of hydrogen less, and it, it shows it very cleanly on the next slide. It's exactly, this is seven moles. You, you silylate it, you get six moles. Exxon used in their H coal process, they used the uh, hydrogenated naphthalines, didn't they? 
Uh, and they, I assume you also <coughs> used in here, you, you <coughs> used powdered coal, didn't you? Uh, finely powdered coal. Believe it or not, it didn't matter. Really? You could, you could just crumble coal up and it didn't matter. Really? Yes. Because I have the idea that although coal seems like uh, soluble like a brick in water, that if you powdered it finely and you had a high boiling, especially a heterocyclic can, uh, liquid like phenanthrodine, uh, appreciable amounts would go in the solution. Call it solution if you would. It's certainly at the temperature of 3849 here, it sort of comes apart. And uh, those little, little pieces that come apart actually transfer hydrogen easily to the solvent. And it, the fact that it doesn't matter what the support is, it doesn't matter what the mesh size is, shows you that it's really easily taken care of. Now, naphthalene, uh, tetra, uh, tetraline is simply a two-ring compound. And it, it, it's, it's not a great solvent for the hydrogen. Oh, yeah. Is it? yeah. Any other questions? Well, I was just curious, in the cholesterol case, when you solate it, is that just a case of just sterically you cannot get down to the catalyst surface and that's blocking it? No, 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 the, the phenol is gone. I mean, it's not a phenol anymore, it's not a hydroxy group anymore. Right. It, it's nothing to do with lying down, it probably does lie down on the surface, but it's gone. Any other questions? I had one more. <laughs> Nobody else okay. does. What the, cat, the catalyst you used was, was a carbonate base. I mean, the pK of the phenols is similar to the pK of your support. Did that play any role since you have a basic support and essentially the phenols are acidic? No, it's acidic. Yeah. I mean, calcium carbonate uh, tends to be, if anything, a little bit alpha. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, so you could get acid base chemistry just between the phenol and your support. Well, one reason I said at the beginning that perhaps it would have been better to use um, something without hydrogen, hydrogen, was I think what's happening, why the amount of hydrogen that comes off is less than you expect, is that uh, phenols are acids. The solvents you have is a base. And I think that the interaction between the phenol part and the solvent. And that's that is a critical part. I think that's happening. It's the, either the, either decreasing its potential or it's putting it out of business to some extent. I think that's why. Any other questions? <laughs>